Welcome Mechanics of Materials students. In this small lecture we're going to be going over the concept of strain energy. So to date in our course we've been we've covered the concepts of stress which is force applied over over an area. We've looked at mean stress that so that we would assume it's the same force applied uniformly over some discrete finite area. We've looked at stress at a point, which is what happens when we take maybe a non-uniform stress distribution and we look at how it applies at a single point. So if we wanted to get mean, we'd have to, to integrate over our area. And we've looked at the concept of strain um, as a change in length or a change in angle uh, relative to the starting length or, or starting angle, assuming that's, that's pi over two. Uh, for engineering strain. And we've also looked at the relationship between strain and displacement, which remembering displacement is that function that says go so far in a given orthogonal direction, uh, x, y, or z, depending on where you start it. So remember displacement is just as a kind of a transportation function thinking of, um, that basically says depending on where you are is a function of x, y, and z go so far in the x direction, y direction, or z direction. And of course this would apply to um, any orthogonal coordinate system. So typically u is our displacement in the x, v is our displacement in the y, and w is our displacement in the z. And of course remember u, v, and w can depend on your position anywhere. So how far you move in the x direction for instance might be dependent on where you are in the z. <laughs> it all depends on um, what's going on in, in a body of that type. So those are our inputs. So we've looked at relationships between stress and strain and developed Hooke's Law expressions for elasticity. Now we're going to take a step back and and basically look at the concept of force integrated over a distance again. So this is a hearkening back to physics and those of you who have taken dynamics you've definitely seen this concept. We all know that stress, if we apply it over a given area, is equal to force. That's kind of one of the ways we, we started out thinking about stress. And we know that displacement, which is a movement in a given direction, um, is related to strain. So what if we took stress and strain and kind of converted them back to force and displacement and then allowed a force to act over a given distance, a displacement, we would end up having work done by that force acting over that distance and if we wanted to get the total amount of work done we would just take the integral of that force dotted that's the vector dot product into a vector expression for that distance over which it operates so this is this is an expression for work done by a force and of course if we look at um, a given system that has work done on it we will increase its energy and we know that elastic systems will store energy, elastic energy, just like a spring. So if we think about stress as being applied to a body, being like the force applied to a spring, we can compress that body against the stiffness or modulus that it has inherent in it. So think of our, our elastic modulus being like a spring constant. We can store a lot of energy elastically in a body. Uh, by by applying stresses to it, and we're going to we're going to in this lecture derive mathematically an expression for the strain energy, the energy that is imparted due to the work done on a finite body by the applied stresses acting to uh, to give some displacement, and then we're going to ha use that generalized expression. Um, to find strain energy for different types of stress states and, and strain conditions. So we're going to start everything with our fundamental definition of energy increase or work done by a force. So F is our force vector of course and dr is our differential displacement. So that radius vector that we use um, to describe work done by a force now think instead of R think U or V or W displacement because we're moving a distance so that's what displacement means. So let's displace a distance r and have the force act through that displacement. 
And for, for this scenario, we're going to go with, um, with a plain stress situation. So here we've got, we're gonna, and we're going to define a, a small volume. So here's our small volume up here. It's, uh, it's got dimensions of delta x, delta y, and delta z. And these are small but not infinitesimal. We can always shrink them down. And so we have normal stresses applied uh, in the y and the x, and we have shear uh, stresses applied in the y and the x. And of course, those stresses, normal and shear, are being applied to both the positive faces. Here's the positive x face, positive y face, negative x face, negative y face. So we're going to tally up the work done by all the stresses that are being applied. Well. You don't see an expression for stress here in work. You see force. So the first thing we're going to have to do is find the equivalent force that is attributable to each of our stresses. Okay, no problem. All we have to do is take the applied stress, like our, say, our sigma xx, and multiply by the area that it's operating over. So, for instance, sigma xx here is operating on this x face, which is delta z in width and delta y in height. So the force due to this stress is just sigma xx times delta z times delta y. And then we've got another stress operating on the positive x face and that's tau xy. So to get the the force of tau xy which happens to be operating in the in the y direction Again, we would just take tau xy and we'd multiply it by that same area, delta z times delta y. So we can go through and we can, we can tally up all of the forces in the y direction and in the x direction for all of the different stresses by just multiplying by the area of the faces upon which they operate. So that's how we're going to get this term, the sum of the forces in the x direction, and this term, the sum of the forces in the y direction. Okay, so how about R? Now, what is the distance over which they operate? How are we going to get how are we going to get this dr um, to describe you know to describe the distance that the stress is operating? Redundant here because um, if you can you can push on something all day long and if you don't move it, you haven't done any work and you haven't e accumulated any energy. Okay, so to do that, we, we punt back to our expression for displacement. So we're going we're gonna to stay with our positive x face here. We know that we can define the displacement of anything that starts on that x face, because remember, displacement only cares where did you start. So we can say, say we have a function for displacement. I don't know what it is, but it's probably a continuous function. We know based on our, our strain displacement relationships, we can define that as d, the first derivative of this expression, which is the, the rate of change of our displacement in the x with respect to x times the location of that x face. So this is going back to our strain displacement relationship. So delta x over 2. If, if point O is in the dead center of the cube, this entire x, x face is sitting at an x location of delta x over 2. So we pop that into our, our differential displacement relationship. And if we want to see how the, uh, the y displacement function is going to operate on something on the y that is sitting on the x face. So back to strain displacement. You're looking at how the, the y displacement is going to act based on where where you are in the x direction in the x coordinate. So using the same you know the same relationship we say okay how much is my v which is my y displacement function changing with my starting x location and then I put in my starting x location which is the x face. So now I have a du to go with my my sum of the forces in the in the x, and I have a dv. Now this is only applicable to any of the stresses forces. Once my multiplying by the the face area on the positive x face, 
because displacement cares where you are. Well, I'm on the X phase, okay? So that's, uh, it's only applicable for that X position, which is fine. We can just repeat for all of the other X and Y positions that we might have. Okay, so we're, we're limited to the X face here. So that's fine. Let's tally up everything going on on the X face. So we drop in our expression for the sum of the forces in the X direction on the X face, which is just sigma XX. And then I have my tau XY, which is shear stress on the X face pointing in the Y direction. That's also operating on the X face, and that's tau XY, the force associated with that is tau xy times the area of the x face. So stress times area x direction, stress times area y direction. Okay, so we're going to tally up, so we'll get a delta u and this line with the subscripts, what, that's a mathematical expression to say we are going to evaluate this for this this location or this set of conditions only. So this is appropriate only for the positive x face. So we're going to go back to we're going to we're going to create one of these just for just for the x face. So we're going to put in our sum of the forces in the x which is just this and we're going to multiply it by its dr that it operates over which is this. And we're going to do the same with our, here's our stresses in the Y, or our forces in the Y, sorry, stress times area. And here's our dr. Okay, so let's, let's simplify this. Our delta Y and our delta Z, those are constants because the cube isn't, isn't changing dimension at this point. We're, we're looking at um, a starting position, so we can pull those out and we can pull out this one half that is taking us from the origin to the x face and that's part of our position so we put those out in front of the integral and so we're just left now with sigma xx times first derivative of our change in displacement with respect to x and then our shear stress on the x face in the y direction times d of sigma v sigma x. Okay, and going back to our strain displacement again, um, the change in u or displacement in the x direction with respect to x is just the normal strain exx and our change in displacement in the y direction with our position in the x is one half of our engineering strain shear strain xy. So we can drop those in so we don't have the derivative of another partial derivative. So we can just simply write this in terms of, of d epsilon xx and d gamma xy over 2. So now we have basically the work done by the shear stress and the normal stress operating on the x face and resulting in displaced certain amounts of displacement in the x and in the y direction based on its position on the x face like that it is on the x face. Well now we can turn around to do the same thing with the y face. So we, we just repeat we're going to have uh, a force in the y direction of just our sigma yy uh, times the area of the y face so its dimensions if we take a look at our cube the y face has a dimension of delta x by delta z. So there's our, our area component that we're going to see in both of these expressions. And if we're looking at displacement, so the, we're gonna, the work done by a force that's pointing in the y direction is going to be based on how far it moves in the y direction. What tells us how far things move in the y direction? Our displacement function, v. And so in order to get the, uh, the y direction movement of something sitting on the y face, we're going to have a uh, dv dy times our, our location of the y face, which is delta y over 2, given that the center is at 0. So the cube, again, is, is, um, is sort of straddling the origin. And we're going to do the same thing over here um, with our uh, 
our forces in the x direction that are on the y face. So we're, we're basically doing the same thing we did for the x face, except we're basically turned it 90 degrees. So again, if we factor out our constants, we end up factoring out um, our delta x, delta y, delta z over 2. Hey, notice how that's half the volume of the cube. And as we were up here, we're left with our, our applied stresses, normal and shear, and then we're integrating with respect to the normal strain or with respect to half of the shear strain. Okay. And so we got, we got a couple of differential, differential equations to tell us how much, how much strain energy we've accumulated due to stresses on the X phase and stresses on the Y phase. So we can put them together. So we can we can add we can add this whole expression and this whole expression. And remember, it's plain stress. So there's only two other two other faces that are, upon which we're seeing stress. So we got two out of the four. So if we combine the strain energy or the work done by all the stresses converted to forces on the x face and all of those on the y face going in both the x and y directions, we get our volume divided by 2 times our normal stress integrated with respect to our normal strain, another normal stress <laughs> in the orthogonal direction integrated with respect to our normal strain, and our shear stress integrated with respect to the full expression for engineering shear strain in that same direction. So tau xy, gamma xy. We lost the one half because we have both both faces. As it turns out, we're going to get an identical expression if we evaluate the negative x and negative y faces we'll end up with a negative sign on the sigma xx and sigma yy and on the taus, but the strain will also be in the, the negative direction. So we'll end up getting an, uh, a double negative and getting um, a sum of work done that ends up being the same sign. So if we add the strain energy or work done by all the stresses on the positive x face, the negative x face, the positive y face, and the negative y face, all of that work, which is the only faces upon which we are doing work, because we got, we're plain stress, there's no stresses operating on the z faces, we'll just double this. We double it by basically getting rid of the one half. <laughs> so here's an expression for our total strain energy. There it is. Wonderful. So we have the volume, and then we have the integral of all of the applied stresses integrated with respect to the strains appropriate for their directions. That's kind of nice if, if we maybe had a continuous function of strains, which maybe we could get if we had displacement. But there may be an easier way to use the fundamental principles of elasticity to, to make these expressions a little bit easier and, and more meaningful to apply. So let's look at at what it means to integrate stress with respect to strain. Well, we all know that the integral of a function uh, that is a you know like a function of x uh, and we integrate it with respect to x we're going to get the area under the curve. Well we know from the principles of elasticity that stress if we're within the elastic range of a material, stress and strain are proportional. That, that's a part of the definition of elasticity. Everything's linear. Um, all of those elastic constants, even in an anisotropic material where they differ in every direction, they are, they're constant. So we can look at stress and strain. I'm going to get rid of this line where I've kind of written over myself. We can look at stress and strain as just the area under, under a function. So let's look at our tau xy. If we plot tau um, on the y-axis and we plot engineering shear strain on the x-axis, we know that we're going to get a straight line with a slope equal to the shear modulus. Right? So the area under that curve is, is equal to basically to 
Um, this is a triangle, so it's going to be one half base height. So we can put in a function that represents the area um, under this integral. So the integral of tau xy with respect to gamma xy is one half times tau xy times gamma xy. That's the area under the curve. That's what the integral is describing. That simple, easy triangle area is made possible due to the linearity of our elasticity relationships. So if, um, if, this, if this were not a straight line, we couldn't say that. But we're, we're describing elastic strain energy, so we can do that. So we can plop in the area under triangles basically for all three of these expressions. So instead of writing an integral, we can basically integrate, get the area under that triangle. So we pop a one half out front and then we just simply have base height, base height, base height. So the change in strain energy due to applying these normal stresses and that shear stress resulting in these normal strains and that shear strain is the original volume divided by two. Very, very useful. So this is for, for plain stress. Notice you're not seeing any Z's there. So if, if we had a generalized situation where we had um, shear strain, so we had a tau XZ and a tau YZ, and then we had a sigma ZZ, all we'd do is just add those terms. So we'd have these that we started with, oops, these that we started with, and that. Then we'd add normal stress and strain in the z direction, and then we'd pick up two more shear stresses and strains as we as we look at what's going on on the uh, on the z face in the y and x directions. We'd still be integrating with respect to v. We'd still have that same triangle area under the curve for the integral of stress with respect to strain in the elastic zone. So we would just add a few more terms to this expression up here. Now, if we want to, if we want to shortcut it, those of you who remember your indicial or subscript notation, this would be our expression for a general uh, strain energy. So one half times the integral of our, str our stress in any direction, so ij can be the same or different, and then our, our tensor shear. So if you're going to use the indicial notation, you've got you've to take your, your gamma and divide it by 2. Otherwise, you might just want to write out the whole thing. So basically, strain energy is the volume over which that strain energy holds divided by 2 times the sum total of stress times strain of all the stresses and strains that are operative over that area. Uh, when does that break down? You've got to match the applicable stresses and strains to the area you're talking about. So if, if you have a change in material or the stress strain relationship changes from one point to another, then you would, you would basically have to add up an integral um, over which the conditions were different. So you might have a certain amount of strain energy in one part of the material and then a different in another part of the material. Um, generally speaking, for this course, we'll be looking at areas or volumes that are small enough or materials that are uniform enough that we'll just have a single expression for the whole material. So if you know the volume and you know the stresses and strains um, in each direction of each type, you got the total strain energy. And generally speaking, if you know either stress or strain, uh, you can use Hooke's Law to write, write this whole expression in terms of either just strain or just stress. So don't forget that um, Hooke's, Hooke's Law is what gave you, um, you know, this nice triangular relationship. Remember, you can, you can write stresses and strains in terms of one another with your, um, your moduli, uh, Poisson's ratio, and other... Um, of your elastic constants. Okay, um, we're done with all the big derivations. The remainder of our strain energy discussions will be putting them to use. But um, just uh, a glance ahead, this is kind of an esoteric idea of, of energy within a material due to elastic deformation. 
um, you'll be asked in a few questions, calculate strain energy. Um, unlike, unlike things like loading and stress when you're designing and you can compare to maybe an upper limit like don't go above yield or don't have something deflect or stretch more than a certain amount. Um, the, the application of strain energy doesn't always seem to be obvious, but the most, um, the most important or one of the most important areas that you will apply this is somewhat indirectly in looking at the criteria under which cracks will propagate. Um, so for fracture analysis, if you have a certain, all materials are imperfect, there's a certain number of little tiny microscopic cracks in everything or some kind of defect that can start a crack. The, uh, as you load those those defects, they'll have act like microscopic, very potent stress concentrators, and there will be strain energy accumulated at the sharp pointy ends of these cracks and little defects. The energy that is released when a crack propagates and that strain is is taken away is the energetic drive for crack propagation. So there are some excellent mathematical models and tests that relate those that we can look up in tables and and that we can model with some some fairly reliable equations. And so the concept of strain energy is is basically the driver for those models that you'll use to decide for a certain applied stress and a certain material and a certain existing flaw size will a crack start to propagate and make something fail or not. So strain energy is um, elastic strain energy. You can think of it as the driver for cracks. And that's probably its most important application in materials and mechanics of materials. Uh, you may not, we may not get to any kind of, of crack propagation criteria in this class, but just understand calculating strain energy is, is very important for how you'll actually put materials to use. So that is it for this lecture, and we will continue with some simple strain energy calculations in our follow-on lecture.